Hello everyone, it is Joe here from Omnipoke, the channel that brings you guys everything Pokemon. Today I'm going to be looking at the best decks in the standard format post Lost Thunder. It's a gigantic set with a lot of new potential archetypes coming out. So today we're going to be looking at what those archetypes might be and how they affect the current decks in the format in terms of where they place in the meta. So let's kick off with the best decks in the format pre Lost Thunder. Here are a bunch of them. I've grouped all Zoroark variants together. Most notably, Lycanroc's been the main partner with Zoroark recently. There has been a smuttering of placements for the other decks like Burnett, Glissopod, Magcargo, and Weavile. Um, then we have Buzzwell Lycanroc, definitely did well in the most recent tournaments. Um, a classic combination that's carried over from pre-Worlds. Buzzwell Shrine, alongside stuff like Weavile and Garbodor, has been also, a dominant force in the meta is a big non-GX deck trying to use shine, uh, Shrine to put damage counters all over the opponent's board. Malamar variants have done well as well, winning the last tournament in America. Uh, there's been a gas can list uh, popularized by uh, Rukan Shao and his testing group, uh, which has been doing well, which is sort of like a split of GXs and non-GXs using Marshadow GX as well as uh, big Necrozma, Dormings Necrozma, and then a lot of non-GX tech Pokemon as well. There's also been a more Shrine-focused build with stuff like Shining Lugia and a heavy line of Tapu Koko. And there's also been the Ultra Malamar build, probably the least uh, popular of all of them, but that is still worth noting. Then we have Vika Ray, Sylveon GX, the sort of mill archetype. And we also have Persimian Tapu Koko, which has started to recently pop up, which again is trying to abuse Shrine of Punishments to put things in range, especially with that Tapu Koko. Doing a lot of spread damage. Persimian, of course, for the typing against Zoroark and also can help deal with some tankier GXs that come down in the late game where they haven't been spread on a bunch. They'll just pop them into play and hopefully the Persimian can rack up damage against them. Lapras Quagsire, obviously a channel favorite uh, as it was popularized by myself. Um, and that's a sort of fun archetype trying to ramp a bunch of energies onto the board, taking advantage of the lack of field blower right now. Glissopod alongside an Orangaroo Mag Cargo engine has also seen play, basically because Zoropod has the weakness of Zoroark, uh, because your type coverage is so poor. Using a different engine to try and fuel the same approach, where Glissopod is tanking, jumping around with Acerolas and Guzmas and stuff like that, trying to oppress the opponent early, is the idea of that deck. Ho-O Kiawe, still a decent beatdown deck with N out of the format, trying to get these big one-hit knockouts and not get punished for it. And finally, we have a double stage two deck in the format in Empoleon Swampert. Both of these Pokemon 160 hit point, tanky, annoying stage twos. Empoleon being able to do a lot of damage output. Swampert shares the same typing as Brooklyn Hill Searchable and becomes your draw engine. So these are the sort of top decks in the format right now. There are a few debatable ones in here um, and still more decks that I could discuss, but that video is just going to get way too long. So these are the ones I'll be highlighting today because all of them have something of note in terms of the new cards they gain or new weaknesses that come out for them. So we'll start by talking about these, but next up we'll see the newcomers into the format. I've put these into two different categories, decks that I believe will be definitely good and decks that could also be good. Trying to look at trends as well. Uh, spotting trends in the meta, or at least trends in the new decks that come out, will definitely help us identify um, the sort of deck that we need to be playing going forward if we want to see success. So, Bacephalon Naganadel, definitely an archetype to keep an eye out for. It did very well in early Japanese tournaments. Um, it is a big one hit KO deck with a new Blacephalon GX, using Naganadel to accelerate energy onto the board for Blacephalon to. Um, absolutely blow up the opponent's active Pokemon using as well B-strings and stuff like that in the mid game for additional acceleration. We have Sceptile GX, a very interesting stage two GX Pokemon with that really nice Grovile as well, um, looking to tank and heal a lot. Then we have uh, Night March 2.0 uh, in Lost March, uh, which is again, lots of non-GXs trying to ramp up into big damage. And we have another creative uh, non-GX variant in Granbull, which can reach 190 with the choice band as well for one attachment, which is potentially very, very scary and is a fairy deck as well. Other decks that could be good, Desi Tails. I think it's an archetype that we've seen before, but now with a new fairy Lola Nine Tails, it gets a new breath of consistency and also some new uh, type coverages, which are very good in the format right now. Uh, Mag Cargo GX being combined with old Mag Cargo, trying to ramp up a bunch of energy again to reach one hit KOs. Zorora Tapu Koko is an archetype that I'm very interested in testing out. Um, trying to take advantage of a lot of the new cards from Lost Sunder, 
Uh, Zerora GX, definitely a hyped card, as well as Electric Power and that Thunder Mountain Stadium card as well. Turbo Quaza in a similar vein, we gain a few cards back that we were sort of missing after Worlds. Uh, getting that little shuckle to get a bunch of energies in the discard pile quite consistently, and Zerorora giving you free retreat, and also providing uh, the Nitro Tank GX that can uh, help accelerate your raise to then just continue for the rest of the game whilst also giving your guys free retreat. Sounds pretty cool. And Alone and Executor, it's another deck that we saw come out of Japan um, where the Executor is the main attacker. Again, you're using shuckle to burn some energies and thin your deck. You use a thin Sceptile deck uh, line both GX and non GX to then cover your Ultra Beast matchups like Blacephalon and Buzzwall and stuff like that. And you use the Grovile to help accelerate your Executors and Lorantises and all the other matchups. So it's a pretty neat non GX deck there as well. So those are the trends I'm sort of seeing. Lots of grass decks with Lost March being um, having the Jump Pluff as the main attacker, Septile GX, and also the potential for a Lowland Executor. Looks like grass is definitely going to be in and around our format, even Desi Tales, you could argue as well. And there are more one-hit KO decks coming into the format. Blacephalon's a one-hit KO deck. Gramble and Lost March are non-GX one-hit KO decks as well, which is very scary. Zera Aura also looking to one-hit KO, Turbo Ray. So really, we're looking for lots of cards that come out in this set that really do just do ridiculous amounts of damage. And that's something to take note of when we're looking at the current format decks and stuff like that. So... Let's give you a little rundown of the strengths and weaknesses of all of these archetypes. So we'll start off with the ones that are definitely good. Uh, shout out to Limitless TCG for providing English proxies for these. I know David Hockman works very hard on translations, and I do really want to give him a shout out for all the hard work he does. So I'm just going to be giving you a real taster of what the deck does. I'm not going to go into like a 60 card list or whatever, but the strengths of this deck is that it's just an all uh, basic GX attacking deck that is able to start attacking with Startle Head uh, pretty early on, using these Naganadals to get energy from your discard pile onto itself, so then Blacephalon can start using them to fuel his damage output, to put them in the Lost Zone, uh, to get big one hit KOs. The Burst GX Attack and Burst Burner, both also good options here. So the deck really is a neat package that can take advantage of both the Heat Factory Prism Star and also Ultra Space, so it does have nice searchability. Even stuff like Mysterious Treasure is very good in this deck as a low count um, to help set up multiple Naganadals. It's got a feel of a Malamar list, but instead you're using Blacephalon in the active and the Naganadals just charge to themselves. That's pretty much the main idea here. You also have good typing with Naganadil and a non-GX attacking option because turning poison isn't the worst attack. It may seem expensive with three colorless cost, but it is really cheap when you're using charge up over a number of turns. It fuels itself for turning poison as well. So you have nice psychic typing against Buzzwall variants and you have a non-GX attacker against Shrine build. So that's definitely something to be aware of. The sort of weakness of this deck is that it doesn't really have any draw engine. It would probably be a Ranguru if anything, but probably not going to see any type of draw in this deck outside of like the stadium and acro bikes and stuff like that. And the other weakness, I did mention that Naganadal can attack, but as they start going down, your board does start to deplete. So it is pretty focused on Blacephalon still. So that is a potential weak spot here. But overall, I think it's going to be a very good aggressive deck. And I think it's going to be one of these pace setter cards because we do have things like Kiawe and we have B-String as well to make an early stand and also have fuel throughout the game, even if your Naganadals are going to get targeted by the opponent. So Definitely a strong deck. Next up we have Sceptile GX. This guy feels like it has a lot of answers for a lot of decks in the format right now. Um, I really like, it's 230 hit points, lots of inbuilt tanking with a jungle heal. Leaf Cyclone as well combines very nicely with Max Potion, so you're only losing one energy after you've, you've used a Leaf Cyclone. It's all very neat when you have the Grovile searching out your stage twos. You have that non-GX Sceptile which completely counters Ultra Beasts, which is... A really big deal because I've just mentioned Blacephalon going to be a strong deck. So a grass deck that can beat the most popular fire deck is going to be a really interesting thing to see in the format. Unless the Blacephalon is teching uh, non-Ultra Beast fire type attackers, which of course it could do. Uh, especially if it plays Kiawe. Then we have um, energy or special energy hate with map cut. So again, this tank ability whilst removing special energy is going to real, really give Zoroark players a headache. Now that they're limited to just 4 DCE, you're forcing them to go into a Rangaroo maybe once or twice in the game. And that's really going to slow them down while you can build up Leaf Cyclones. Uh, you can use that Jungle Heal against spread decks as well. So Sceptile seems to have answers to literally everything apart from one hit KO decks. This is where it's really going to fall down. 
Obviously, you have the out to Blacephalon with the baby Sceptile, but it's the other one-hit hero decks in the format where you're really going to start struggling. Things like the Lost Marches, the Ho'okiaways, um, the Rayquaza builds, these are going to be the things that really keep Sceptile at bay, because otherwise, I feel like this card is very strong. You can lose, use Sunny Day Lorantis to improve Leaf Cyclone's output. Just one in play plus Choice Band gets you to 180, which is a pretty reasonable number. Two Lorantis in play is the dream, uh, where you're reaching 200, which is nice. You even have nice type coverage against Lycanrox uh, and Laprises, which is relatively relevant, so... I think Sceptile's really, really good for a Stage 2 deck. Um, again, it doesn't have much draw engine. Its damage output isn't great if your opponent is going to start targeting Lorantises. Um, and the only thing really holding this guy back, I think, is the amount of one hit go decks that are going to be appearing in the format if they do end up being good enough. From there, we have Lost March. A lot of people are hyped about this deck. It does have ridiculous damage output once you start using that Skip Bloom's ability to get your Jump Bluffs into play. Um, you also have Trumbeaks and Lost Mixers to improve your damage output. There's nothing wrong with slapping uh, Choice Bands as well in your deck as well for even more output. And just being a non-GX that can go boom is always something to be aware of in the card game. It's going to really put pressure on other decks like Blacephalon and Sceptile and all these things where you simply just win prize races because you are non-GXs and it's so many for your opponent to get through that you have time to build up your combo to where you're just smacking too hard for them to deal with. Weaknesses for this deck, I would say Spread is probably your biggest enemy. Jumpluff is your tankiest Pokemon in the deck with 70 hit points. And Natu has 40 hit points, so you can't really bench those against Tapu Koko style decks. And you're also worried about the new Giratina coming out in Spread Malamar. There's definitely an issue here that you have to resolve. Um, there's even things like the Alolan Ninetales GX, which is being splashed into some things like Boswell, like Decidueye, that really is going to cause you a lot of grief because your guys are so fragile. And the other weakness is potentially that it sometimes requires too much setup. If your opponent is starting to deal with hopips here and there while you're not getting fully set up, they're really just going to reduce your damage output to where it's not getting one hit KOs. And when it's not doing that, it's not a problem for these decks. Zoroark decks will be tanking, using Acerola and knocking out even more stuff on your board. And it's just going to get really unfortunate for you. One other note for Lost March is that it has two really good typings in the game right now. Hitting for Grass Weakness is good. Again, like I said, for Lycanroc uh, and Natu hitting Weakness on Buzzwall and a few other GX Pokemon out there as well is going to be really nice. So the deck does come with a pretty neat engine. Like, it's not hard to tell, like, 40 of the cards going into this deck just by having, like, your Jump Bluff line, your Natus, your Trumbeaks, your Lost Mixers. Uh, your turbo cards like that. Lots of ball search cards going to be required here. We have netball coming out in the set. So um, the engine is pretty easy. So the fact that everyone can build a relatively good 60 cards just from the offset means that it's probably a threat and will just be fast, relatively consistent, and will be able to reach these knockouts in most situations. From there, we have Gramble. This is probably the most exciting deck, I think, from the set, just because it's going to be a puzzle every time you play the deck. When you're playing Granbull, you're basically playing against yourself the whole time. Penniless is the attack that you focus on here, where for one fair energy, you do 30, and if you have zero cards in your hand, you do 130 more damage. So with Choice Band, you're hitting 190, which is an absolutely amazing number for dealing with every um, basic GX Pokemon out there. You have that Fairy typing to also be very good against Rayquaza. Not that that matters too much. You still need to be using uh, the second effect of the attack. But basically every... Um, Every basic GX is going to fall prey to the Gramble. When you're up against other non-GX decks as well, you're doing 160, which is good against things like Empoleon Swamper and everything else. So as long as you can chain Penniless every single turn, this deck is going to be very, very dangerous. You do have things like the Ditto Prism Star, which is going to be really nice when you're trying to set up two Stage 1s here with the Mag Cargo Engine using a Ranguru to instruct into the right cards, using things like Lost Mixer and Ultra Ball to get your hand down to zero. I think the... The only issue here is that there are going to be turns where you draw an amount of cards and either you can't attack or you can't do enough because you've only instructed into three cards and that's not going to give you, you know, like the Guzma that you need or the energy attachment plus the evolution that you need that turn. So it's going to require constant setup throughout the game rather than some decks which just sort of like spends two or three turns setting up and then it's sort of ticking over for the rest of the game. Gramble every turn needs constant attention and it's going to be difficult to pilot to perfection i think to make sure that your penniless is doing the most but 
Really, the fact is, Gramble is a 130 hit point stage 1 that also has resistance to dark, so it's a real pain to deal with for a lot of decks, forcing their main attackers into the active position most of the time. Its output is insane, and it's a full non-GX uh, non deck, so it does pose a real threat. My only qualm is that every now and then, you're not getting the most out of the attack, either by missing the full amount of damage, which is obviously terrible for you, but it's more sort of the fact that you'll be missing Guzmas, missing putting down, you know, a spare Gramble or a spare Snubble here and there because you're so prioritized on having zero cards in hand that sometimes you have to accept the fact that you're not fully set up just for tempo purposes to make sure that you're doing the most amount of damage in the active. So Gramble, definitely a potentially dangerous deck. It's whether or not you can get enough Mag Cargos and Orangaroos on the board to make it work perfectly. Moving on to some of the more debatably good decks in the format. Desi Tails I have in the sort of could be good zone because we've seen it all before really with Decidueye Ninetales. This is a deck that's been around for ages uh, when Forested, Plant, uh, Forested Giant Plants were still around in the format. Why would it return now? Well the idea is this fairy type Alolan Ninetales GX provides so much help to this archetype that we could see it return. Uh, there are a few other new cards in the set that can help out. Things like that Netball means that you can reduce your grass energy count and then also have Netball being able to search Rowlets in the early turn, which is good for consistency. You can use Brooklet Hill as your stadium for turn as well um, to get your Beacon Vulpixes down on the board. So it's going to be really easy for you to spread the board, especially with Elm coming back into the format. Um, Beacon being able to search out your Decidueyes and then moving into that Fairy Alola Ninetale is going to start finding you things like Rare Candy and some tech one of tool cards as well that you could be playing. I think uh, this is one of the best decks that can take advantage of counter gain, actually, because using your Fairy Lowland Ninetales is attacks with just one attachment is going to be insane. You'll naturally be quite slow because you have lots of um, evolving basic Pokemon, and if you use your Feather Arrows correctly, you can keep counter gain live while still pressurizing the board in a lot of different situations. I think the fact that you can also use the water type alone in Ninetales means you're probably going to have a pretty good Blacephalon GX matchup. The fairy typing gives you a good matchup against Rayquaza. Sublimation GX gives you good outs against the, um, again, another answer to Blacephalon and also good against Buzzwall. The Decidueye sniping is going to be very good for Lost March. So I think you do have a lot of answers to decks. Uh, my biggest weakness would be it does require a lot of setup. You're hoping that your beacons don't get judged away or let loose away, stuff like that. You will definitely be clunky in the early turns. You probably are playing special energies as well, rainbow energies uh, and DCEs for your razor leaves and being able to use all of these attackers. Um, so I think there are downsides to this deck. It is sort of wombo combo-y and reliant on beacon at times. It may end up just being too slow like we've seen it previously, but I think there's enough support here with... Elm, um, Netball, uh, Brooklyn Hill being put into the deck as well as a sort of counter stadium to Shrine, uh, whilst also giving you consistency. I'm really happy with the build I have, and I think this is one I'm really looking forward to profiling because it's a very creative and interesting deck to play, I think. And I'm a Decidueye fanboy anyway, so I'll always try and make it work. This is definitely an interesting one that I have on my radar that I haven't seen much from Japan, but I think it could be one that's worth exploring. Next up we have Mag Cargo GX. This is a deck that did well at Japan and I've put it in here pretty much just for that because I personally don't have much hope that this deck will be that good. I understand that Mag Cargo GX works very well with the basic Mag Cargo, but I think overall as an attacker, Lava Flow is a little bit too expensive. The benefits of the Mag Cargo deck is that the engine will be very smooth, literally with Mag Cargo, and your damage output can get very powerful with Lava Flow. My only weakness would be that you pretty much need to get like four stage ones on the board pretty quickly. And if you're up against other one hit KO decks, it's going to be really hard for you to use Crash Charge enough times in a game to keep up with their attacks. So I think with your water weakness, you don't want to face a certain amount of decks like Lapras. I know water's not the most important type right now, but it is something to be aware of. That Ninetales I just mentioned as well is going to be awkward for you. Um, and yeah, you need to get lots of Makagos into play on turn two. Your smooth overs have to be using, uh, you have to be using smooth over to get fire energy a lot of the time to make yourself quick enough to be working. So you're not getting them full usage out of smooth over in a lot of cases. Personally, I think it's a little bit slow, but because we've seen results with the deck, I didn't want to write it out altogether. So I think this is one of the weaker decks I'll be talking about today, but it could still show up just because Makago is that good. Zerora Coco is another deck that I want to experiment with. I think Zerora is, on paper, just an absolutely ridiculous card, so I'm going to try and make it work in any way possible. 
In my mind right now, I'm thinking of playing the Naganadel here as well, the one that we use with Blacephalon, but instead in this deck, we're going to be powering up Naganadel and then using Tapu Koko's Aero Trail to jump into the active position and start using Sky High Claws with Choice Bands and Electric Powers to get one hit KOs. You have that Tapu Thunder GX attack as well in certain situations. There are still a lot of decks that do like to flood the board of energy. So I think Tapu Koko does get a lot of value. If you are going to go early game with like your Acrobikes and Sightseers, you might be able to get enough energy in the discard pile to even use a full voltage to start powering up like your other Zeraoras and Tapu Koko. Zeraora is still an insane attacker in every situation when you're not against fighting decks. So it is a really ridiculous card. Giving yourself free retreat and... Being able to um, Aero Trail with a second Coco and then Acer Rollering up something damaged still seems like a very powerful deck. So definitely one I want to experiment with. Naganadol giving you good typing against Buzzwall as well means that yes, you're weak to Zero Aura. Oh, sorry, your Zero Aura is weak to them. That's going to be chilling on the bench, whereas you've got Naganadol as well threatening attacks on their active Buzzwall a lot of the time. So it's going to be a strange back and forth matchup of hitting for weakness here and there. Um, so I think the biggest downside for this deck is it's not going to really appreciate other Shrine builds, especially if Buzz Shrine remains a deck. Uh, even though you are using, like, Coco, which doesn't have weakness to fighting, you will be a combo-based deck, and you'll be kind of weak to Garb um, what's it called? Trash Lunch Garbador. So that's going to be kind of awkward for you. Again, Naganadol can prove as an attacker, but if you start using Naganadol to attack with, and then it starts going down... Uh, we don't really have any energy left on the board, so that's something to be aware of. I do think this archetype will work, though, because I think that Thunder Mountain, Zero Aura, and Electric Power are all too powerful to not see play in this format, to be honest. Next up, we have Turbo Rayquaza in a similar vein to the Coco deck, just with a different coat of paint. You're going to be using Rayquaza GX instead. Stormy Winds giving you early game acceleration alongside full voltage GX, or we can use the Prism Star... Uh, I believe it's Latios or Latias, I can't remember. Uh, the one that accelerates energy that we saw used at Worlds. We can use uh, the new Shuckle to get more energy in the discard pile and just go aggressively with, again, Sightseer, Acrobike. These sorts of things are great um, additions for the deck. Zero Aura giving you freedom of movement between your Rayquazas as well. My image of this deck is going to be going for early full voltage GX alongside a bunch of Stormy Windses with your Rayquaza. Get your deck to a really thin size. Uh, using these Sightseers, Acrobikes, all that sort of stuff for additional discard, the Shuckle if you really want to, and then just putting Wishful Batons on your board so that you're taking advantage of the lack of Field Blower in the format and just hoping that when your Rays get knocked out, you can just plonk the energy all over the board, or sorry, onto your next attacker, and continue to never lose your damage output. I think this will be probably more consistent than Vika Ray, and I believe... Potentially powerful. As long as Field Blower remains out of the format, I think it could be a big threat. Even if Field Blower is in the format, you still have Plasma Fists as an attack to fall back on on your Zero Aura. You'll naturally attach to it once because of full voltage GX. And if you have space for Thunder Mountain as a one of um, and Choice Bands, you could still go for Plasma Fists for knockouts as well. So I think there's definitely something here. Turbo Ray has worked in the past and we're starting to get enough tools back into the format to make it seem viable again. Just because, again, Zero Aura is such a ridiculous card. I'm not going to write it off. Next up, Alone and Executor. A pretty interesting deck that came out of Japan once again. It's a non-GX-focused deck, and Alone and Executor has 160 hit points. So it's just such a pain to deal with for a lot of different decks. Similar to how we saw the Sceptile build, we are going to be playing a thin line of Sceptile in this list. Using like a 2-2 Grovile and then like a 1-1 split of your Sceptile, the Baby and the GX. So that you have... The GX to use if you're up against Zoroark decks, and the non-GX if you're up against Ultra Beast decks. So it's kind of like a grass box build at this point, using Shuckle to thin your deck and get rid of lots of excess energy cards, powering up that Tropical Shake. And this is, again, just a real pesky non-GX attacker that can get powered up with Lorantis. I think compared to Sceptile, it has a lot more setup required because you're, you know, you're jamming in an extra Stage 1 line and having to use Shuckle, which takes up a bench space for you. And without a draw engine, I could definitely see this clunking out. I mean, you do have Groval for like a pseudo draw engine. It can search out things. But beyond that, it's going to be a little bit clunky in my books. So I think there are there is definitely something here. It's like playing the Sceptile deck, but instead of losing to O-Hit KO decks, you kind of lose to just being a bit clunkier more than anything else. But um, again, we've seen this before, and it's definitely something worth looking at. So let's return now to the top decks pre-Lost Thunder and talk about how these adapt. At the end of the day, we're not just going to all pick up the new cards and play exclusively the new decks. We're probably going to be looking to adapt um, 
the current decks that we have in format and see what tools they get from the new format and also have a look at what new threats come out for the deck. So I've put all these archetypes into three different categories. They're either declining, thriving, or adapting based on what I think is going to be happening in the format upcoming. Obviously, this is all speculation, but I have tried to outline the new cards you could be playing in the deck internally to see how much that improves. Then we'll look at the sort of new bad and good matchups here, and we'll also be looking moving forward how I picture the deck in terms of where it places. So here are the sort of thriving, adapting, and declining decks. I think at the moment, Malamar Shrine definitely sort of pole vaults its way to the top of the Malamar variants. I think the spell tag and the uh, Giratina that we'll talk about in a moment is just incredible. Zorak as well, gaining a lot of new consistency tools. Adapting, we've got Sylveon, Persimion, Coco, and Buzzwall, Lycanroc. Declining, there's a big pile here, and obviously they're not all going to just go out of significance altogether, but as new decks do come into the format and as the card pool increases... Obviously, we will sort of be stripping away the sort of worse archetypes and keeping the best ones for ourselves. So that is just the way the game works. As more decks come out, some need to sort of go into the back of the binder but for better alternatives. So let's start off with our thriving decks. As I did just mention, Malamar Shrine. Giratina is just a great front man for this deck. Um, with that shrine, with the ability that Giratina has and that spell tag, giving you great control over where you put all these damage counters, making your Tapu Koko spreads and that Shrine of Punishment damage ticking over become much more specific. So now you're taking knockouts throughout the game rather than just being a deck that goes spread, spread, spread and either Necrozma GX to finish the game or a Psychic clearly to move the counters to win the game. Now it's much more board-centric spread than previously because you're going to use your Giratina and Spell Tag proactively to ruin your opponent's board setup as you go, hopefully buying yourself time to do even more spreads or start using that Giratina to get one hit KOs because he also hits 130 on his own, by the way. So he is pretty silly as a non-GX attacker in general. Whilst also having a resistance to fighting, there's like a lot of a lot of boxes being ticked by the Giratina all at once. I think Sightseer is a nice addition for a deck that likes to put energy in the discard pile and also thin out things like Shrine in matchups like Mirrors or other non-GX variants. So that's going to be a pretty cool addition in terms of consistency. And also I think Onyx and Lavatar too basic fighting attackers that you can splash into your deck to have better answers against Zoroark also sounds like a very good idea. I think you can beat Zorak without the use of Onyx and Lavatar if you use your spreads effectively, um, but I think splashing in one of these, if you're already going to play a couple copies of Rescue Stretcher, just makes sense to make that a much easier matchup. You're already playing DC anyway in the deck for Tapu Koko, so Onyx and Lavatar probably going to be inserted into these decks to, to really sort of hard counter the Zorak matchups, which will be very relevant. I think your new favorable, definitely lots, uh, Lost March. Uh, everything has really fragile hit points, and you'll be able to prey on that pretty much every time you see it. I think for threats, there aren't many. Uh, Sceptile GX as a deck to, altogether is going to be awkward, even though you are playing Shrine. They have a GX attack that heals the board, and they have max potions and stuff like that. And they hit the golden 130 damage as well with their two energy attack costs. So I think they are going to spell trouble for you overall. And I think other than that, People are just going to have to start teching for this deck. Personally, you know, we saw it win in Japan. And the fact is, the spread is just so dangerous right now with such a good stadium combined with Coco and now Giratina and Spell Tag. Just there's too much support for a spread archetype right now that we have to acknowledge that and start playing things like Ditto Prism Star and Machoke or even just um, Machops and Machoke because Ditto Prism Star only has 40 hit points on its own. So he seems pretty fragile uh, to use in the first place. Um, so I think decks are going to have to start adapting and putting in Machoke in the format because I honestly think Malamar Shrine is a very dangerous deck. As I said down below, uh, your win condition is just absolutely accelerated with the spell tag being specifically placing the counters where you want it. And the deck just has a better engine now with Sightseer being added to the list as well. So overall, I'm very excited to see Malamar Shrine. I think it will be a top tier contender. Zorok variants. The new additions are absolutely insane for this deck. Professor Elm's Lecture means that we can strip those four nest balls, take out like the three or four lilies that we're playing, put in four elms, we gain spaces, and we have an even better early game. It's just a real big thumbs up from me for the Zorark builds. Gaining Ditto Prism Star as well is absolutely bonkers. It means you have like a fifth Zorua in some cases, but also using things like Macargo Tex, uh, Lycanroc, 
um, Weavile, Bennett, Glissipod, all the things I've already mentioned, Ditto Prism Star can be one of those cards. And it can even be tech cards. Uh, I just mentioned the tech Machoke, which you might be employing into your list. Also things like Alolan um, Muck can be put into the deck to start disrupting people and putting off other basic GX Pokemon that are going to try and use abilities to give you a headache. You can start shutting those off with Ditto. So I think this is going to be an insane inclusion in a lot of decks, but I think Zoroark makes it work the most because it's so consistent and fast. And just the more Zoroarks you have in play, the more times you win the game. That's pretty much how it goes. So an extra fifth Zorua is ridiculous. And also, especially for the Zoro control variants, Faber is a really nice card. We saw um, E-Hammer and Lusamine, or sorry, um, Plumeria being played in some of these Zoro builds. Faber is going to be in addition or instead of these cards um, to, again, give yourself even more control. Now, for new favorable matchups, there isn't many. I think you're not too happy with the amount of one hero decks coming out in the format. Um, but I think at the same time, you're a Zoro deck and you can target weaknesses. Just because you are evolving turn two, you know, using Gust on turn two with Lycanroc, picking off their most important attacker. Just because Zoroark is better in a vacuum, I think that was reasonable enough to say that Zoroark is a top tier contender and will be shining in this format because... Man, it's been so sad having to play four Great Ball, four Nest Ball, and like three Lily. That engine is atrocious, and having good old Bridget back, effectively, for this deck at least, um, it's just going to go back to Mr. Consistent, as I put down below. And yeah, I mean, I think you have enough stage ones that can be partnered with Zoroark as the meta starts to develop and take shape that we can start taking advantage of these decks, be it things like Weavile um, for all these Naganadars and uh, Malamars running around and mirror matches, be it Lycanroc as always, just because Gust is ridiculous, and we even gain counter gain as well, which I should have put on the new additions. Uh, it makes your Lycanroc GX attack even more likely of happening, even when you have no semblance of a board. Just a lone Rockruff is threatening enough for the opponent to deal with a lot of the time because of counter gain now, so that's ridiculous. I think for new threats, if Sceptile GX does see play and can sort of fend off the one hit KO decks, definitely going to be awkward for you because it has enough healing. And it also just removes your special energy, which is a real pain. And Gramble as well seems to be very awkward. They only hit 190, but they're probably going to be playing Shrine anyway. And when they start doing that, the Gramble has 130 hit points and resistance. That's a huge headache for Zorok builds to start getting around. So I think those are the biggest issue matchups for the deck. I've put all the sort of one hit decks. They sort of are threats, but at the same time, if you can target their engine early, you'll probably stop them from working. Just like how we've seen Zorak continue to perform, even when there are big one-hit KO decks in the format currently, like v Ray and stuff like that. So I think the format may still be volatile for Zoroark. Um, it always will be, pretty much. But because it's internally so much better, I have high hopes for this archetype. Looking at the adapting decks, Sylveon does gain a lot of tools. Faba as well, excellent for this card. Fairy Charms, being able to completely stonewall decks or at least force field blowers from them is going to be really cool or really frustrating, I guess. Choice Helmet as well, giving you reduction. It may not be as good as Dumbbells, but in some situations it will be better because you can tank hits more often if they're having to like two-shot for you anyway. And Giraffe Rig as well gives you an out to removing things like Orangaroo Tex or Rescue Stretcher or these other cards that are going to try and recover in the matchup. So it gives you an out to beat decks even when they're teching against Mill, which is definitely something to note. New favorables, Gramble and Sceptile. I don't think they'll ever reach knockouts against you, so you can just do your shenanigans and run them out of stuff. Gramble probably only plays like 7 or 8 energy. Sceptile probably plays like no more than 10, I would say, from my early builds. So I think those will be fairly easy to grind out. New threats, Blacephalon has so much energy acceleration from the discard pile, they will just burst over you. Lost March as well can get that big burst over you, and they have nothing with big retreat either, so that's going to be quite easy for them. And Zera Aura Coco, because everything has free retreat, again, you can't really target that down. As long as they um, use the Naganadel build, they can get energies like back as much as they want if, they, if you're going to start trying to hammer them away. Um, and they also have electric power to reach those big knockouts as well so i think these are the ones to be aware of for sylveon and i think moving forward as always sylveon has to sort of see how the meta settles down to start putting in the correct text and building a correct 60 but at the same time its attack is so annoying there are enough tools and um other items and whatever in its disposal to still see play so Mill is always going to be on the radar because of things like counter catcher lucimine faber 
Uh, all these sorts of cards are just so annoying to deal with. Acerola, Max Potion, um, that Sylveon could still work, uh, depending on how popular the Lost Marches and the Blacephalons start becoming. If they are too popular, Sylveon won't see play. If not, there could be a chance for this deck. Persimian Coco also has a lot of new additions, which is why it might be adapting. I think Larvitar, to be honest, just outclasses Persimian in most cases. Uh, using Larvitar, it does uh, 10 plus 80 more if there are three counters on your opponent's Pokemon. So that's 80 base. You do 20 more with a Diancie, and you have Choice Band on top of that. So you're doing 130, which is the equivalent of uh, three Persimians being in play. Um, it's only better to be a Persimian if you're up against evolving GX decks because you can use the Persimians that effectively count as 60 damage for each one you have in play against those evolving guys. So the Larvitar is just more consistent and requires less bench spaces, um, but the Persimian has the option to go higher than Larvitar ever could. So I think the trade-off will be more towards the Larvitar. I think that's what's expected. Also, the Victini is definitely notable. You are using a counter-energy style deck, and having Victini to answer the new Sceptile deck coming out is definitely going to be worth noting. Sightseer, great for this deck as well, because you can start trimming the fat and getting rid of lots of excess cards that you never really like. I've tried this build, and using like four Lily is just so sad, because so often you're just drawing like two cards and accepting the fact that you have to do that. And the deck currently doesn't play any discard. Uh, it's only using... Um, like nest balls for search so you don't even play ultra balls so having sightseer in here to remove some cards that you don't need in certain matchups is going to be excellent for you and you have electric power tapu coco doing flying flips just got even more dangerous when you can be doing like 80 damage to the active and 20 toward the bench it starts to sound like a volcanium prism star just for a dce and that sounds absolutely busted so uh, electric power also amazing for the tapu coco new favorables you're a spread deck you're probably going to be quite good against uh, lost march Zero Aura Coco isn't going to appreciate Larvitar hitting for weakness on your Zero Auras. Uh, and even though you have Naganadel, it doesn't really matter because anything could be knocking out Larvitars. Uh, Turbo Rayquaza, I think, should be favoured for you as well, just because you have enough time to do all the spreading shenanigans to win the game. New Threats, Gramble, and Alone Executor, two non-GX variants that also have high hit points. So it's going to take sort of too long for your spread variant to take effect a lot of the time. And you're going to have to be, like, switching between using Coco spreads and using Larvitar to finish things off. It's going to be a little bit too awkward for you, I think, against those sorts of builds. But yeah, as I said, moving forward, Larvitar probably going to be subbed in for the Persimian package. I'm not 100% sure on this, but I think it definitely, in my opinion, is better. Um, and the Victini as well, being a new counter-energy card, could also help out if, again, the Sceptile and the Decidueye start seeing a lot of play. So definitely an adapting archetype that I will think is coming out of the woodworks pretty strong because Larvitar is a dangerous card. Next up we have Buzzrock. A lot of decks with Buzzrock have moved over to a Alolan Ninetales GX line. A lot of the time currently we're seeing Macargo engines going on, but it looks like in Japan everyone is using the Fairy Alolan Ninetales GX. Mainly isn't it, well, it's good just because of its ability, but it also provides good sort of type coverage against Rayquazas, also very good in Mirror and against Blacephalon because of its GX attack. And it's also very good for Lost March because you do 70 active, 30 to the bench. And again, becoming a spread deck is just such a pain for Lost March because you also have Jet Punch to finish things off. So the combination of an attacker and an ability uh, oftentimes will um, outvalue what you can get with a Mag Cargo engine. So I do believe most people will be moving over to Alolan Nine Ninetales just because getting two B-strings on the perfect turn is like so ridiculous a lot of the time. Lucibeam Prism Star is another card that you could consider in this deck. Uh, I don't think it's guaranteed to be in any of these builds, but it has been in a couple of Buzz Tales lists that I've seen from Japan. New favorable matchups. You want to see the Turbo Ray, I think, and you want to see Zero Aura Coco. Uh, Nine Tails hits for weakness on the Rays, and you have weakness on the Zero Auras. And against Zero Aura, again, you hit for weakness. And even if you don't hit for weakness against Coco, you can reach one shots anyway. So that should be fairly routine for you to trade up on them. New threats, I think you're not going to appreciate Sceptile. Obviously, they don't get damaged by Ultra Beasts, and your Lycanroc is weak to Sceptile, so you're pretty much all in on a Alolan Ninetales, and it doesn't do enough damage in most situations. Similar story for Alolan Executor, just a non-GX, so it's even worse. And Decidueye Ninetales is going to be awkward. Uh, the Ninetales has that GX attack that can deal with your um, Buzzwall. They also have Grass Typing with Decidueye to do with Lycanrocs. I think they have the answers within the deck to beat you, I just think 
oftentimes the Buzzworld deck will be too aggressive for it anyway. So uh, I think it may still be able to continue onwards. And I definitely think that putting in a 2-2 Ninetales line alongside a 2-2 Lycanroc line is going to be successful. I think this deck is definitely dangerous. And the Ninetales, in my eyes, is an excellent addition for cer uh, certain specific matchups, but also a great engine for consistency overall. Onto the decks that start to decline. Oh, I'm so sad. Lapras Quagsire. It gains so much as well. It gains Sightseer, Suicune GX, and Adventurous Satchel to give you better draw power with Sightseer. The Satchel is also nice so that you don't need to play like 40 XP share and a high choice band count. You can have a lower count of these cards, but still have Satchel to guarantee them more often in the early game as well. So even though you're reducing counts, the Satchel gets two XP shares at once, which is exactly what you need so that you can maintain attacking throughout the game. I'm just going to take a quick swig of water here. As we have a look at the new favorables, the Cephalon obviously hitting for weakness, so your Quagsire and Volk Prism Star will be leading the charge, taking knockouts, and uh, really just be too difficult for the, for the Blacephalon to handle. A similar story for the Mag Cargo, because we hit for weakness, we can start swinging with the non GXs and just out trade them. New threats, there's a lot of grass coming out. This is why I don't like Lapras Quagsire in the next format. Lapras just isn't tanky enough at the moment. Lost March is going to be a pain. Sceptile and Alone in Executor will all be huge headaches for you. And Granville, it hits 190 when he has Choice Band on it, so that's also going to be disgusting to deal with, I think, in many situations. Moving forward, as I said, the deck in a vacuum gets way, way cleaner, but it's just the amount of grass decks. If they are seeing play, Lapras is just going to be back of the binder territory, which makes me very sad. Next up, we have Straight Glissopod. It's ironic that I'm saying so many grass decks are coming out and Glissopod will be getting worse, but that's because the Sceptile deck is a GX build, that can compete with um, Blacephalon, whereas Glissopod can't. And the other two grass decks I'm talking about are non-GX, so it doesn't matter that they're weak to fire, because pretty much everything can knock out uh, one prize Pokemon anyway, and they're just going to try and trade up. So Glissopod isn't immune to um, Blacephalon, and therefore it's in a disgusting place. I think it's also scared of Magcargo, scared of Lost March, scared of Turbo Ray, and scared of Zeraora Coco. It's really similar to Sceptile in my eyes. It just has even worse Blacephalon and you're less likely to tank stuff because you only have uh, 210 hit points. So I think it comes with all the issues that Sceptile has, but even more so a lot of the time. Again, there are some nice new additions. Netball is a great card. Ditto Prism, if you're playing a Mag Cargo and Glissopod, is just an insta include. Life Forest as well, giving you some help against like spread decks or decks that just try and like two-shot you if you're using stuff like Armor Press. That could well be a nice stadium for you if it stays in play. I think the only good matchup you want to see is Alone and Executor because you'll just be able to jump and heal around of Acerolas while they do pretty much nothing. Um, but there's just too many new decks coming out from this set that I think are awkward for a Glissopod Mag Cargo build. And that's why I think uh, it won't see much play in the future. Moving on to V-Caray. I've already mentioned how I like sort of Turbo Ray instead. But I think a lot of decks are just going to be more consistent at one hit KOing. I think the fact is, Blacephalon is a basic in stage one deck with great search ability that it pushes Vicaray out of being the most consistent and speedy one hit KO deck. It does gain Zero Aura for some nice freedom of movement. Netboard as well could potentially see play, giving you more outs to get your Tempest GX, whilst also giving you outs to get your Grubbins down. Um, new favorables, it wants to see Sceptile and Magcargo but really doesn't want to see Lost March, Gramble, or Decidueye Ninetales. Uh, even stuff like Buzzwell Ninetales gets like a much more difficult matchup, whereas Buzzwell versus v was kind of 50-50-ish um, before the Ninetales was added in. Now it gets a lot, lot harder. Um, and moving forward, a lot of Ninetales just being put in the Buzzwell deck and the Decidueye deck really should make Ray a lot less safe, I think. And if you want to play a big one hit KO deck, it looks like Blacephalon's the safer option, to be honest. Next up, we have the non-Shrine Malamar variants. It does gain, again, the Spell Tag, the Onyx, the Sightseer, the same things that the uh, Shrine build did get, but it's just the fact that Giratina is such a ridiculously powerful card, and it's so neat in a spread variant, that I feel like that is just going to be the best deck. Um, for the Malamar builds. I mean, you do want to see the Sceptile and the Mad Cargo because this build, unlike the spread build, um, can reach big one-hit KOs because you do have the um, Necrozma GX that can do big knockouts. 
It doesn't really want to face many Shrine decks. It doesn't want to face Zero Aura Coco. It doesn't want to face Blacephalon or Gramble. These are all decks that can one hit KO just as consistently. And it means that your, your sort of um, tech attackers that you're trying to use don't really work in these sorts of situations. Uh, Deoxys doesn't do enough damage against, you know, the Zero Auras, the Blacephalons, stuff like that. And however, they're all doing big one hit knockouts turn after turn. And that's really disgusting for you. So I think... Malamar will be best as a Shrine variant with the Giratina. The only caveat to that is if people are starting to counter the Tina variants, you can start moving back to other builds of Malamar, maybe more toolboxy like we've seen with the very popular Gascan builds. But Shrine, I think, is starting to decline in play, actually. The only real card it gains is Ditto Prism Star, which is nice, to be fair, because you are playing like Macargo, Garbodor, Weavile sometimes as well, and that's going to be a nice one-off for you. Uh, new favorable matchups, Zero Aura Coco if you're nice typing and it's an all GX deck. And Turbo Ray as well should be pretty favored, if, especially if you're playing um, the Weavile. Even if you're not, both Turbo Ray and Zero Aura Coco are probably heavy item based variants with like four acro bikes, lots of Ultra Balls, uh, Mysterious Treasures, all that stuff. You can definitely prey on them with Garbodor as well. New threats, you definitely don't want to face Gramble, Sceptile, or Alone and Executor. Sceptile and Alolan Egg, they are going to take no damage from the Buzzwall. Sceptile can heal around Shrine. Doesn't need to play too many item cards because of that Grovile engine that it's going to be using. So a lot of your attackers will be doing pitiful or no damage. Similar case for the Alolan Executor, just even more poor because Shrine's not even doing anything in that matchup. And Gramble as well, a non-GX that can keep swinging for 160 every turn in theory. It's going to be bad for you while you try and scrabble to keep up. The only benefit of the Gramble matchup is, of course, that they have to use a lot of item cards. So your Garbodors will be trading on them turn by turn. It just is sort of... The Gramble has like a thicker Macargo line with more Orangaroos. So if they just target your uh, Macargo, your engine will deplete a lot quicker than theirs. So uh, I think that's why it would be kind of a threatening matchup for you. I think moving forward, the biggest issue for this deck is that the best Shrine deck out there seems to be a Malamar build. And the Malamar build is going to be very awkward for the Buzz build. Obviously, you have Weakness, they have Resistance, and they have additional spreads to start dealing with, like the Trubbishes and the uh, Sneasels and stuff like that that you have on the bench. If they can take additional knockouts here and there, you're just never going to keep up with the prize trade. So I think that's definitely going to be an issue for you. Even the newer GX decks come out in the format, like I've said, Sceptile, is going to be a bad matchup rather than a good one, even though it's a GX. And Blacephalon, even though it is a GX Pokemon again, they're going to have a thick line of that um, Naganadel, which is a non-GX attacker that can start carving through your board as well. So definitely something to be aware of. Buzz Shrine looks to be a lot weaker going forward. Next up, we have Empoleon Swamper. It again, games that Ditto Prism Star, which is nice. You are going to be playing like two copies of your Marsh Tomps and your Prim Plups sometimes. So having a Ditto Prism to start evolving into these is going to be a little bit nice. You have Elms Lecture as well. There are 60 hit point Mudkips you can be using and Pit Plups. Uh, we do have a load of Ninetales GX as well that you can be putting into your deck to help you search out um, more rare candies for you because you're already probably going to be playing Brooklyn Hill and Beacon. So that could be a nice one-off in your deck. Oh, excuse me. Uh, then we have some favorable matchups. You want to be seeing the water weak stuff, basically. The Cephalon and Magcargo, you can feast on quite nicely as long as you can get set up. However, there are, as I've mentioned a few times now, a lot of non-GX decks coming out in the format. Lost March, Gramble, Andalone and Executor, all non-GXs that are probably faster than you that can trade on you very, very easily. And that spells really bad news for this deck, which requires way more setup than all of those. You also don't really want to see Sceptile. It's so tanky and can deal with your stuff very quickly. Decidueye Ninetales can spread around the board and again can hit for weakness on the um, the Swampurts, which is also very awkward for you. So I think those are all pretty bad matchups. Going forward, as I just mentioned, I think it's outclassed by the other non-GX decks. We really are spoiled in this set by getting Gramble and Lost March and a little Executor potentially all being good decks that are non-GXs. It really does push out these other fringe ones that have been seeing play a little bit here and there, but won't anymore. So next up, we'll move on to ho oh The only real card I can think of putting in this deck is Heat Factory Prism Star, which is, to be fair, a very nice one-off for the deck for some additional consistency and late-game protection. It does have a very good Sceptile, and again, my cargo, just because you're a one-hit KO deck, they're a one-hit KO deck, but as you start to carve through their guys, they start losing their own abilities at the same time, and that's their acceleration. 
So you eventually will get more attacks in than they will. I think for new threats, again, the non-GX builds, <laughs> the Lost March and the Gramble, super threatening for a deck as linear as Ho'o Kiawe, which is very GX focused, and it's just going to be swinging into the active. Zero Aura Coco, also awkward thanks to that typing, um, and they can also potentially tank here and there as well. Uh, moving forward, I think Coco spread is another headache for Ho'o Kiawe. If Coco is being put into more decks like the Lavatar build, uh, which was you know previously the Persimian build, and also the um, the Gar uh, Giratina Shrine build, I think that just spells huge trouble for Ho'o Kiawe. It basically can't win if Coco is heavy in the format because it just does too much against them, whilst also setting up bench Pokemon like Lele's and whatnot for the Giratina to start sweeping those. Uh, Ho'o Kiawe hates facing non-GX deck at the best of times, but if it's one that has a heavy amount of Tapu Koko, especially with electric powers, you're just never going to lose that. You're never going to win that game. It's just ridiculous for you. So I think Ho'o Kiawe really is pushed out in the meta with the amount of um, Ohiko decks again that we see in this set that are probably more consistent and have more late game and they won't fizzle out like Ho'o sometimes can do. So finally, this brings me on to the general shifts in the meta. Evolution decks will be more consistent, I think, thanks to that Ditto and Elms lecture. I really am happy with this. Uh, Zora decks are, once again, just really consistent. Has a very simple turn one Elm into turn two, start digging for your Zoro arcs, and once that's online, your whole deck is going to start ticking away, which is great. Um, also, some stage two decks really will benefit from Elm in here, so that you don't just sort of get one of your basics guzmed up on turn two, and then you instantly lose the game, which is currently like kind of what can happen in the format, which is really stupid. Um, I also think, I've mentioned a lot in this um, video, the damage output of decks is like one of the big selling points of them, and it really is going to start becoming one hit KO versus one hit KO, absolutely slogging each other in the face for a bunch of damage. Uh, both GX and non-GX builds that come out in the set can hit ridiculous numbers, so it feels like tanking isn't going to be great, but Sceptar might be the exception to that because it has a very good Buzzwall, and Blacephalon being one of these one hit go decks that you can uh, simply stonewall means that it might still have a chance, so that's something I would bear in mind. Ultra Beasts do have that check in Alola Ninetales and uh, Sceptile, Alola Ninetales with the excellent GX attack for a fairy colorless so if you use counter gain and like um, unit energy or rainbow energy you can get them with one attachment which is going to be silly and that septile having the uh the baby septile to get around that as well going to be awkward so we might have to start seeing some non-gx attacking techs obviously at the moment we see lichen rock but that's weak to grass so that's a no-go uh against septile and for blacephalon it's probably gonna have to play like a kiawe and maybe like one ho -Oh or one turtonator something along those lines Against the And finally, uh, Shrine Spread. That will continue to be dangerous. I mean, I have said that the Buzz Shrine deck is probably going to get weaker, but I think mainly the heavy Coco variant with maybe just like Electric Powers and one or two tech Pokemon here or there could definitely see play. Uh, but also I think the Malamar Spread deck is going to be potentially very good. And I can see Machoke uh, sneaking into decks, especially thanks to Ditto. Um... Machoke is going to really give you an out to these things. I think some water decks will be playing Lana, which is hilarious to uh, beat spread decks. If you play like one Lana, one Palpad, you can beat spread with uh, with Lapras, which is fun. I've always got my eye out for, <laughs> for Lapras, as you know. Um, there's a few other decks out there. Things like Acerola and Max Potion will continue to be played in Zoroark. As I said, with the Elm engine, you gain a few more deck slots now, so that's going to be committed to some of these weaker matchups like spread builds which could also be very awkward for you so going to be very interesting how the format shapes up i'm very excited to start playing with a lot of these new cards i have a lot of questions for them um lots of these new one hit hero decks are out there they don't all necessarily have great draw engines behind them but we do gain sightseer we already have acrobike lots of ultra balls lots of mysterious treasures in the format to start abusing um, some sort of turbo decks as well. So I'm very excited to be testing out this format. Let me know how I did, guys. What do you think about um, sort of where I've discussed these decks? Do you think one of the decks I've mentioned deserves to be uh, in a different position? Maybe it's not declining, maybe it's adapting, all that stuff. I'll love to hear it all down below. What's the best new deck that you're expecting to come out of this set? And what are you going to be playtesting on day one? I'd love to hear your thoughts down below, guys. I'm going to be moving into some deck analysis starting uh, next week as well. So you're going to start seeing the decks that I've discussed today. Um, 
and we'll be looking at the 60 cards themselves and how they look to function and how clean those lists are. They'll all be scrutinized next week. So thanks so much for watching, guys. It has been Joe from Omnipoke, and I'll see you next time.